Family, you know. For years I was a transactional coach. What can I get? What can I get? And uh, when you get fired, it humbles you. I spent 430 days outside the game. Everybody asked, uh, you know, you were here with the Aggies in 2011. No, I wasn't. I was fired. And uh, I just sit there and watch the Aggies play. And God has brought me full circle and changed my life. I was dead and he saved me. And so I'm a transformational coach now. It's not about wins or losses. It's about love. It's about building men, building relationships that will last forever. I got a second chance. This guy's a second chance guy. This guy's a second chance guy. This guy's a second chance guy. We're about building people up. You know, it's not Mission Omaha. It's Mission Build and Save Lives. And that's what we're in the business of doing. This is the most unselfish, selfless group of men and families I've ever been around. This is rare in this day and age. Rare in a, in a microwave society where it's all about entitlement and all about when do I get to play. This guy's playing with a broken left hand right now. Nobody knows that. His left hand's broken. Last year he played with a broken wrist. Last year Taylor Bean played with a broken thumb. I won't even get into the rest of the litany of injuries that are going on with this team right now. Andrew Frije just walked up to me in the dugout and said, give my last at bat to Nate Van Dyke. Robbie Rojas gave up his last at bat so Hunter uh, Sutherland could catch. You know, there is no greater honor. And this is, uh, I could preach. It's what I wish our, our country would get back to. There's no greater honor than to sacrifice for a brother. And that encapsulates and embodies this team to a T. That's why they're so lovable. Uh, let me open us up in prayer, guys. Father well, God, just come to you with a couple of things. Number one, I want you to know that I love you with all my heart. I'm thankful for second chances. Dear Lord God, number two, I pray for the absolute truth today. And I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. You know, uh, when I was leaving UL Lafayette, the Lord spoke and, and he speaks to me a lot. And he spoke to me and he said, uh, I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you on just a little bit bigger stage. And this is when I was leaving UL Lafayette. And at the time, UL Lafayette was the number one ranked team in the nation, all five poles. And uh, I'm very selfish, and I'm very opportunistic, and that guy lives inside of me. And I'm very egotistical, and I have to die to that guy. And so when the Lord spoke, I'm going to take you and put you on just a little bit bigger stage, I, my first assumption is, oh my God, I'm getting a huge job. I'm going somewhere big. This is going to be about baseball. And shortly after that, he spoke that into me before I got the head coaching job at Sam Houston State. And he spoke that into me, and I got the head coaching job at, at Sam Houston State. And what I found out three years later was that it wasn't about baseball. It was about that right there. That video got over 40 million hits on it. And it was never about me. It was about God using me. I was just a vessel that God used at that moment in time to spread his message of love, grace, redemption. And I can't tell you, I've heard from people worldwide, you saved my life. And I'm like, are you serious? I didn't say, unbelievable. I show this video to my AA group. I can't tell you what this is doing. I'm going to church now. And that is the way that God works. God uses the broken things. And when he spoke this to me, he, he put, he put, he, anytime God speaks to me, he puts a verse on my heart. And he took me to Isaiah 43, 1. And he said, do not be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. 
And I, th I truly believe, I don't even think, I know that's the little bit bigger stage that God had in mind. And since then, it's taken me to places all across this country, speaking to wonderful groups like this, wonderful churches, and just spreading God's word. And I want you to know the reason that I do this. I've missed, I've, I'm going to miss two practices with our ball club to be here today, but I truly feel like it's our my mission. The reason I do this is because I was dead, and now I'm alive. And I've got no choice but to do this. I'm going to do this. And so I want you to know, brothers, that I am here today, just like Jesus said in Luke, I am not here today for the healthy. The healthy don't need a doctor. But I promise you, I promise you, there is somebody here today that is heartbroken, that is lost, that is hopeless, that might be living in despair, that is living an absolute lie. I know that. And that's why I'm here today, because I want to share with you that God does make all things new. And as he says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he makes all things beautiful in his time. And he plants eternity in all men's hearts. So I'm thankful for that opportunity to be here with you guys today. I like to tell people when I speak that I've been around the block not once, not twice, but three times I've been around the block. I've been all the way to the top of the top. And I have fallen but over tea kettle all the way to the bottom. I didn't fall halfway. I've fallen to the bottom and hit with a resounding thud. And it's very, 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 very humbling. You see, I was for six years, I was the associate head baseball coach at Texas a and Before that, I was a recruiting coordinator and hitting coach at the University of Arkansas. I've won an SEC title, been to Omaha, five titles at A&M, finalist for the head coaching job at Mississippi State, interviewed for that job, interviewed for the U of H job. I was in my mid-30s, mid to late 30s, and thought I had the bull by the tail. I also, on the other end, live in Huntsville, Texas now. where the state prison is located. And I, to this day, drive by that state prison every single morning on purpose to remind myself, thank God I'm not in there. But it also reminds me of another thing. The only thing more agonizing than living in a prison with four actual walls where somebody put you is living in a prison of your own making with four invisible walls where you put yourself. At least when you go to an actual prison, there is an opportunity for ownership. But when you live a perpetual lie, when you live a life of sin, greed, lust, addiction, there is no escaping that. And that is the darkest, dankest, loneliest place you can possibly live. At least in a real prison, there's opportunity for ownership and to begin anew. But when you live a perpetual lie in an invisible prison, every day is Groundhog Day. And so I want to share with you men this morning five things, five things, five lessons that I've learned from going around the block, not once, not twice, but three times, from going up here to down here and back up here by the grace of God. And the first one is this. There's two kinds of people in the world. Those that are humble and those that are about to be humble. That's an absolutely true statement. 
And I had to find this out the incredibly tough way. See, I lost everything because I was arrogant, I was egotistical, and I was living as an absolute enemy combatant of the cross. <clears throat> and what's worse than that, what is worse than that is that I knew Jesus Christ. I was saved when I was 10. Rededicated my life again in 2004. But I continue to live as an enemy of the cross. It speaks to that in Hebrews. If you know the word and continue to defy it, there's going to be a special dealing with you. And I'll have to cross that bridge. But I was living as an enemy combatant. And I found this out. That your private life, and Cody spoke to this earlier, your private life will ultimately become your public life. What you do behind closed doors will ultimately become public. And how you treat people matters. Even Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve. How you treat people matters. Mark 9.35, if any of you wants to be first, you must first be the very last. And servant of all. I had it backwards. I stepped on so many people to get where I was. I figured out and found out the hard way that those are the same people you pass on the way back down. So there's two kinds of people, those that are humble and those that are about to be. Let me tell you some humbling experiences. Humbling is looking at your three kids and letting them know that daddy's going into rehab. That's humble. Look at your 11-year-old son, 6-year-old daughter, 4-year-old daughter, and tell them daddy's going to rehab for 30-plus days and watch them drop to their knees and grab your pant leg crying, begging you not to go. That'll humble you. Losing a $200,000 a year job Best job in the country for an assistant coach. I was working with my best friend because I couldn't put a beer bottle down. That'll humble you. I spent 430 agonizing days outside of the game. See, baseball was the only thing that I have ever known. It was the only thing I have ever been good at. And I made a deadly mistake. And I believe it's one of the more common mistakes that the enemy puts on us. And my mistake was this. My sole purpose and my sole identity was wrapped up in Matt Daggs, the baseball guy. And here's the problem when you wrap your identity in something of this world. When you wrap your identity in the businessman, the coach, the professional, the whatever it may be. Money. When you wrap your identity in the things of this world, you ultimately are going to get exposed. It will be an impossible image to live up to. And when that image is tarnished, or you don't live up to the hype, and you're living on spiritual empty tank, there is going to be a hole in your heart that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. But here's the mistake. You are going to attempt to fill it with the things of this world. You're going to attempt to fill it with women. I don't care if you're married or not. You will. If you're a competitive alpha male like myself, full of testosterone, you're going to try to fill that with women. And alcohol is going to fuel that. And drugs are going to fuel that. Because your identity is wrapped up in something of this world. Your identity is wrapped up in what you do. And I figured this out that nowhere in the Bible, I figured this out through sitting out of baseball for 430 days. Nowhere in the Bible did it call me to be a baseball guy. I couldn't find it. Essentially, it called me to do one thing. 
Love the Lord my Love the Lord our God with all my heart, mind, body, and soul, and love my neighbor as myself. That's it. That's my identity. My identity is found in Christ. But so many men make this mistake of wrapping their identity and their value and their worth on something so temporary as baseball, as football. That's not who I am. That's what I do. And so I had to learn that lesson the hard way. And I spent 430 agonizing days outside of the game. I had to watch my kids change schools in the middle of the year. That'll humble you. That'll humble you when your kids have to go from a private school to a public school. Because guess what? There ain't no more money. It'll humble you when you've got to explain to your kids... That you're now on free lunch. Just go sign a piece of paper, baby. They'll give it to you. You're on free lunch now. Because daddy can't put a beer bottle down. Because daddy has a hole in his heart. Because daddy lived by the things of this world. Because daddy was living a life that was temporary. Because daddy was running on spiritual empty. That'll humble you. Lost my family for a period of time. Lost every so-called friend. Had the game taken away from me. The team, the last team that I had built and put together at Texas A&M. See, God has a way of snapping you to attention. The last team that I'd ever put together or built. I watched them win the Big 12 without me. Win the Big 12 tournament without me. Host and win a regional without me. They went to Florida State and they won the Super Regional without me. From my parents' couch as a 39-year-old man, because I'm kicked out of my house, because I can't put a beer bottle down, I watched the team that I had helped build, mold, and coach for years compete in the College World Series. That's humbling. That's a kick in the you-know-watch right there. And it'll snap you real quick. When I turned 40 years old, I had gone from here to when I turned 40 years old. We had blown through all of our savings. And I was working at a feed mill outside a college station. Loading 18 wheelers with cattle feed, horse feed, deer corn, with Guatemalans that don't speak English in the dead of summer. Because I couldn't put a beer bottle down. So the first thing I learned is this. Two kinds of people, those that are humble and those that are about to be humble. The second thing I've learned along the way is that God's not going to save you. And I know that sounds counterintuitive to what we're doing here today. God ain't going to save you. God ain't saving you until you decide to stand up and take action. Too many days I was living in perpetual lust, sin, greed, addiction, and the, 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 the twelfth beer of the day was going to my lips. And do you know what I had the gall to do before that happened? I was still making, Father God, please take this from me. Please take this from me. But you know what happened right after I did that? Pop another one open. See, God's not going to save you. The darkness does not live in the light. Darkness, by very definition, is nothing. It's an absence of light. And I was living in the darkness. And praying for God to save me while continuing to live in perpetual sin. It does not work that way. It was not until I decided to stand up. And just like Jesus told Lazarus, get up. You're dead, now you're alive. It was not until I decided to stand and take a single step. 
See, everybody talks about Jeremiah 29 11. What's Jeremiah 29 11 say? It's a trendy verse. It's a go to verse. Why? What's it say? I know the plans that I have for you. Heck yeah, what are we going to do? Right? Where are we going? Plans to prosper you. Plans not to harm you. Everybody wants to feel safe. But you got to keep reading. What's Jeremiah 29, 13 say? You will find me when you begin to seek me and seek me with all of your heart. You can't continue to live in the darkness and pray for God to save you. That ain't how it works. You have got to muster the gumption to stand up and take one single step. And when you do, I promise you, he will be there for you. With outstretched arms. With outstretched arms. There's nothing you've done that you're not beyond his grasp. So it's up to you to take action. You know, I'll give you guys a good analogy. The man that helped save my life was the head baseball coach at, at UL Lafayette, Raging Cajuns. His name's Tony Robichaux, and he's one of the wisest men I know, and he believes in second chances. He's the only guy that would hire me. 430 days outside the game. I was damaged goods. Nobody would touch me. I couldn't get a job at a junior college that I, I was the head coach at for five years. They wouldn't even interview me. Tony Robichaux was a man that believed in second chances and he helped start to redeem me. And he sat me down one day and he told me to look at things like this when living in perpetual sin. He said, I want you to think about it like a truck. And I want you to think about washing and waxing and spending three hours detailing your own truck. And now you're driving down that road. And there's a huge muddy pothole in the middle of the road, but you have worked your butt off on that truck. He said, tell me what you're going to do about that pothole. I said, well, <laughs> that's a no-brainer. I'm going to go around it. He said, exactly. Because your truck's clean. He said, but let me ask you this. What if you've been out mudding all day in that truck? And that truck is filthy. And the same potholes in the middle of the road. What are you going to do then? And I said, not only am I going to go right through it, I'm going to seek that type stuff out. See, when your truck's dirty, you look for it. But when you take action and you do something about it, and that truck is spotless, surrender at that point is not an option. I'm going on five years without a drink right now. I don't go to meetings. I don't talk about it. I don't do any of that stuff. I handed it over to Jesus Christ. And he said, I got this. This is nothing. Nothing. And I will promise you something. Promise you, you would have to put a gun to my head and pull the trigger before I would take a drink. It ain't happening. Because I stood up and took action and Jesus Christ was right there. The third thing I figured out is this. The most important thing you will ever do in life is respond. You see, adversity doesn't make you a man. Everybody thinks adversity makes you a man. Anybody can go through adversity. Adversity doesn't make you a man. Adversity only does this. It reveals where you're at as a man. And here's the funnest part. It reveals where you're at as a man for everybody to see. Everybody gets to watch. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to lay down? Are you continuing to kill yourself because of self-doubt and despair and hopelessness and the fact that you're so selfish you're living a lie? Are you going to stand up, take one single step, humble yourself, 
and do something about it by responding. The most important thing that you will ever do is stand back up. Get up. Not down, get up. I've learned to become thankful for those opportunities. James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. But I didn't know that then because I was living a lie and my spiritual tank was on empty. That is how the enemy will grab a hold of you, men. <clears throat> if your mind and your physical body and your spirit are running on a quarter of a tank, you need to fix that today. If what you're putting in your mind is of this world, you need to change that. Because you will ultimately become that. If what you're feeding your body is not good for you, it's going to creep into your mind. And when it creeps into your mind, it's going to create a vicious cycle because it's going to hit your spirituality. And then that's going to trickle down into your relationships. It's all part of being a man. The most important thing you will ever do is respond. Fourth thing is this. God rewards faith, sacrifice, obedience, and service. I have no doubt in my mind. That video you witnessed, that came out of super regional. We were seven outs and one game away from Omaha at Sam Houston State. You got to be kidding me. But see, God, yes, he does. He takes the broken and uses them. That's true. I love this saying, God gets his greatest warriors from the highlands of affliction. And it's true. It's true. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 31. God uses the foolish things to shame the wise. He uses the weak things to shame the strong. And this is what I love. He uses the lowly and despised things of this world to nullify the things that are and the things that have been so that no one will boast in themselves, but boast in who? Jesus Christ. That team got to that point by boasting in Jesus Christ through faith, sacrifice, obedience, and service. His face is shining down upon Sam Houston State. John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. A man that remains in me will bear much fruit. But apart from me, if that spiritual tank is on empty, you will bear nothing, not a zero. And if you do, it's going to be brown and withered and ain't nobody buying it. God has blessed everything I have touched since I gave my life to him. Stood up, took one single step, responded, and started living a life of faith and sacrifice and obedience. Let me take you guys real quick through my last five years. 2013, got to UL Lafayette in the middle of the season in 2012, and the team I walked into was 23 and 30. They were pitiful. Pitiful. I didn't even go to half the games. I just started recruiting. Okay? 2013, the largest turnaround in the NCAA that year from 23 and 30 to 43 and 20. We lost to LSU in the Baton, regional, Baton Rouge uh, regional final to go to a super regional. That team that I had led the nation in 27 out of 30 offensive categories at one point. It was the number one offense in the country. Same cast of characters. Added a few new recruits, same cast of characters. Okay? 2014. First mid-major in the history of college baseball to become the consensus number one ranked team in the country in all five polls to end the regular season. That team went 58-10. and 10. Two wins off the all-time record. That team led the nation in offense. 2015, blessed with my first head coaching, D1 head coaching job. 
2016, Sam Houston State Bearcats, first team to win the, win the regular season title, win the conference title, and lost in a regional to the Arizona Wildcats. And they finished in the national championship game. And then 2017, we pulled off the seemingly impossible. Won our tournament again and advanced through, this is going to hurt some people here, the Lubbock Regional, and finished in a super regional for the first time, not only in school history, but in conference history, God rewards faith, sacrifice, and obedience. His face is shining down upon us. And every time I get a chance, that's what you're going to see. That video, I don't care. People say, well, you speak the word. And this, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care who agrees with it. I don't care if you say, well, you can't talk like me. No, 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 no. When you've been dead and Jesus Christ has saved you, it gives you an empowerment that makes you dangerous. Because you've been on the other side. Damaged people are dangerous because they know they can survive. Right? If God is for you, who can be against you? Everybody says, well, you're going to go through that, you know, look at now, you're going to start getting attacked. <clears throat> and God took me to, once again, God took me to, uh, you know, everybody quotes Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? But back up. God took me not to 1 9. He took me to 1 5. He said, Nobody will come against you all the days of your life. Walk by faith, man. Faith, sacrifice, and obedience. I'm going to finish with this. God's promises are real. When I was fired and I was living in what I call the desert, the loneliest, darkest place you can ever imagine. Your damaged goods, nobody wants you. You've lost every friend. You've lost what you've tied your identity to. And there's a feeling of hopelessness that's so heavy, I wanted to die. And I had to sleep with my four-year-old Chloe at night to fill her heartbeat to stay alive. And even in the midst of this, God would wink at me. God would talk to me. Even in the midst of me living in perpetual sin, and I have no doubt about it, is because His grace is greater than our sin. And the reason we can't snap out of that is we're living the lie that we're not forgiven. But God would talk to me. And during the course of being in this desert, I remember one day distinctly. And when he would speak to me through these visions, I would draw. I drew these visions. And I drew the words that went with these visions. Even in the midst of living in this desert, I did this. And if you're ever at my office, you'll see them because they're, they're hanging in my office, these drawings. And he put a vision on my heart one day after being turned down for yet another job. I interviewed for the job at Texarkana College. I had taken them to Grand Junction, Colorado to the World Series. I'd been the head coach there for five years. They wouldn't talk to me. Interviewed for Galveston Junior College. I was the associate head coach at Texas A&M. Oh, man, I was stripped of everything. Interviewed for a job in South Dakota. Interviewed for a, a NAIA D3 school in Nashville, Tennessee. You name it, and if it opened, I interviewed for it. And nobody would touch me. And one day after getting turned down yet again in the midst of this desert, God spoke to me. I was taking a nap and I was in that state where you're kind of asleep, but you're kind of awake. You could actually answer a question maybe, but you're kind of sleeping. And God put this beautiful queen palm right here. And he put another beautiful queen palm right here. And he put another beautiful queen palm right here. And he put a little bitty brown shriveled up queen palm that was limp and bent over. And it was at a marketplace and people were coming up and they were looking at these palms and they were buying these palms. And God spoke to me at that instant. He said, you see that right now? That's you. I'd just been turned down for yet another job. He said, you see that right now? That is you. He said, they're going to buy every one of those palms. But he said, you see that little bitty shriveled up palm right there? That's you. That's the state you're in right now. 
and nobody is going to buy you right now. He said, but someday they will. Someday they will. And he just winked at me and he took me to Job 8, 5 through 8. Even now, if you will rouse yourself on God's behalf, he is righteous and eager to save. And though your beginnings, and this is what I want you to hear, though your beginnings will be humble, though your beginnings will be humble. I went to, I'd, I'd gone from making 200 plus to finally get the spot at UL after working at a feed mill for 42,500. He said, though your beginnings will be humble, prosperous will be your future. I just signed the largest contract in the history of the Southland Conference. Humble will be your beginning, so prosperous your future will be. Because I responded, because I got up through action, and Jesus Christ was right there, and I started living my life through faith, sacrifice, and obedience. Another instant, after I'd been fired, the interesting part about being fired is this. Is that you have to wake up every morning. And that is very, very tough. You don't want to wake up. Because when you wake up, guess where everybody else is? They're actually at a job. Okay, so it's very humbling. <clears throat> so I started jogging. I would jog in the mornings. Started jogging. And then I'd drink in the afternoons. I was still living a lie. Right? So I was jogging around our neighborhood as a three-mile trek. This is in 2011. I'm in College Station, home of Texas A&M. And I'm jogging. I can't make this stuff up. It gives me chills telling all this. I'm jogging. I have no hope. I'm in despair. And I'm living as dark a life as you can lead without being dead. I am one instant from being dead. And I look over and I stop jogging. And in the grass is a ticket stub. I thought, that's weird. So I stopped jogging and I went over and I picked up that ticket stub. You guys know what is a ticket stub too? A Sam Houston State University Bearcat baseball game. That's where I'm at now. Just another little wink by the Lord said, keep, get up boy. Just keep going. Just keep going. And in hindsight, looking back, years later, I can start connecting the dots, but you can't do it at the time. My entire career, my entire career had been an identity of baseball, and it was always tied to the number 15. Always tied to the number 15. Just sanctimonious, just, just egotistical as heck. But when you don't have a job and you finally get hired by the only school that will hire you, you have no bargaining power. And the only jersey that Sam Houston State, you know, or uh, the only jersey that UL Lafayette had when I got there was number 28. I gladly took number 28. So I'd gone from 15 to 28. Unbeknownst to me, God was working. The day I got the job at Sam Houston State, this was two and a half years later, my wife's devotional came out of Genesis 2815. I will be with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For those of you that don't know, A&M is here, Sam Houston State is here. They're separated by about 40 miles. And I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Put you on just a little bit bigger stage. Is also Kathy and I's wedding anniversary, June 28th. This was before it ever happened. I quit drinking February 28th. I was named the head coach at Sam Houston State, June 28th. My name is Matthew. Do you know how many chapters are in the book of Matthew? 28, baby. 
I believe that God will speak to you, and I believe that His promises are real. In closing, I want to say this. Our program lives by magic. Jesus looked out on them and he said, with man, you're right, this would be impossible. But with God, all things are possible. It's only impossible until somebody does it. Only impossible until somebody does it. If you can see it, I don't care what it is, if you can see it in your mind's eye, and if you can believe it in your heart, and if you can wake up before everybody else every day and outwork everyone for it, punch that car and just go to work, at that moment you're in the business of the impossible. Let me close this in prayer. Father God, I thank you so much for the gift of salvation. The gift of second chances. For the fact that you do take the broken and you make them beautiful. Mm. Thank you, dear Lord God, that we're living today. We might not be exactly where you want us, but praise Jesus, we're not where we were. Give us the strength, dear Lord God. May you forgive us for where we've been and sinned against you. May you bless every step of this journey that you have us on right now, dear Lord God. And I pray one thing today, that you would open our hearts to be grateful, thankful, full of service, and fearlessly content right where you have us. That we wouldn't chase the things of this world, but we would chase, not just chase, not just chase, jump into your open arms and pursue that relationship dear Lord Jesus if there's anybody here today that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior I pray that you would convict their hearts give them the strength to stand up and come on down and lay it all down for him we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this opportunity and I love these men and I thank you for bringing me right here right now it's in the name of Jesus Amen any questions?